So we will start with a recap of what we learned last week, in particular applying the example of the independent activity. Remember, the goal is that you know the conditions to select a test in order to solve a particular problem or answer a particular question. All right, so this is the focus of this review, to make it really clear to you under which situations you would pick a z-test over a t-test, for example, because that's the job that you will have to do during the exam. All right, so the problem statement. A well-studied biomarker of lipid metabolism is percentage of body fat, or simply BF percentage. BF percentage has been related, for instance, to a highly prevalent vascular disease, atherosclerosis. This condition is characterized by excessive accumulation of fat inside the arteries. The evolution of this disease is silent, but can eventually lead to devastating consequences. Atherosclerosis is, for instance, a risk factor to stroke if fat accumulates and clogs around the neck, um, around the neck here, and interrupts the blood flow to the, to the brain. Every year, 55,000 more women suffer a stroke than men. An important question, therefore, is whether females have greater percentage body fat than males. If so, it might be one factor underlying uh, the gender-based differences in stroke prevalence. So we have a question. Do females have greater percentage body fat than males? The data. We have um, male, the male population here, and we want to assess the population in terms of percentage body fat. There is a true average percentage body fat for the population of all males. And there's also a true average for the percentage body fat of the population of all adult females. What is that average is the question, right? We were in a situation where we know there is information about, like a good estimate about what the average uh, percentage body fat of females is, okay? Imagine we have a prior study that have made an estimate of that average. And let's say that average is 35, okay? What we wanna know is whether the percentage body fat of males is smaller, reliably smaller than the average percentage body fat of males. Imagine we don't have that information, so we would have to take a sample from that population in order to get an estimate of the percentage body fat of males. And that's what we did. We took a random sample, that was a study, a random sample of males in the population in order to estimate from the sample, we wanted to estimate the uh, average percent body fat. And the point estimate of the true average percent BF is going to be the observed or the X bar, the observed average of the sample. All right. And then what we want to know is if that observed or the X bar observed percentage body fat in our sample, which is an estimate of the percentage body fat of the population, is different from that particular value of 35, which is the value that we're accepting uh, is the average of the female population. All right, so we have an X, an X bar, an average observed, and we want to that is estimating the average of the population of males, and we want to know if that's equal or different from the average um, that we know uh, of the female population. So our question, do females have greater percentage body fat on average than males? The data, we have an estimate of the true average of the population in terms of body fat of the male population. And we want to know if that's different from the known average of the female population. So now we have to set up hypothesis here. 
the null hypothesis is that nothing is going on and that the true average body fat of the male population is 35, just like the female. The alternative hypothesis, which is directional, remember they suffer less uh, from atherosclerosis and stroke, etc. Um, so the hypothesis is that they may have less percentage body fat, which, which is the like the central risk factor for that disease. So our hypothesis is that males have less than um, the percentage body fat that is observed in females, less than 35. And once we have that in hand, right? we want to describe the data in order to see if some conditions are met in order for us to be able to apply the z-test right so we want to compare the, the the we want to know we want to compare means but we want to know in order to compare those means we need to know um, whether certain conditions are met for us to construct the sampling distribution of the means under the null hypothesis. So the descriptive statistics here, we have um, a histogram that suggests a pretty normal distribution. And the average um, body fat that was observed, X bar, X observed, in the sample is 23.18. And we can conclude that males the, the, the average observed in that sample is, sm is smaller than the average of the population of females, which is 35, right? But that difference could be simply due to sampling error. Because if I sample from the population of males multiple times, even if the true average percentage body fat was 35 in the population of males, if I sampled multiple times, it's not likely that I would get 35 every time. So what is, I can't assume that 23 is atypical. Maybe it's just sampling error. Maybe it's just the expected variation, right? So we need to check. We need to check and get a p-value. What's the p-value? It's the probability of likelihood, probability or likelihood of observing this data, in this case, this average that's smaller than the pop, than, than 35, um, using appropriate sampling statistics. What's the likelihood of me getting a sample that has that average, 23.18, if the true average of the population is 35? Because if that likelihood is high, then the null hypothesis should stay. If that likelihood of me getting that average is low, then we dismiss the null hypothesis. So we need a sampling distribution in order to compute what's the variation expected in means were I to sample multiple times from the population. Except in reality, I don't do that. I need to do that from one sample. And the nice thing is, is that if the data meets the conditions uh, to apply the central limit theorem, then we can construct mathematically that distribution under the null hypothesis. And in this case, it does. First, there is independence of observations. The males I got from the population, I selected randomly. I didn't select people all from the same family. I didn't select people all from sports, people like sports professionals. So they were randomly sampled. And the size of the sample is less than 10% of the full population, such that I'm not necessarily including data that is not independent, right? So if I include almost all of the population, some of the data there will have dependency. Condition number two, the sample size is large, and it's pretty large, way bigger than the magical 30, right? And it's not even that skewed, right? It's a little bit to the side here, but pretty close to normal, which tends to be the case for larger sample sizes. So that's good. So given that the conditions of the central limit theorem is met, now I know that the sampling distribution under the null hypothesis will be normal, will have the normal shape, so it's a Z distribution. And I'll put the mean, um, I'll put the mean at 
35, right? The center of the distribution at 35. Why? Because I'm getting the distribution under the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is that the average body fat, percentage body fat, is 35. And the spread, the expected variation around the mean, is the standard deviation of the sample, which is a good estimate of the variance of the population because I have a large sample size. Um, but I will divide by square root of n because that is affected. The, the actual sampling variation is affected by the size of the samples that I take. If I were to take multiple samples of this particular size, then the expected variation will be the standard deviation divided by square root of n. The smaller the sample, the more variation I expect because the precision of average estimation reduces. So because I'm dealing with a, a sampling distribution that's normal, uh, I can use a z-test to assess the likelihood of observing this particular mean under the null hypothesis that the male population actually has a mean of 35. So I ran, we run an, a one-sided t-test because our hypothesis is one-sided, right? So our, our hypothesis is that the male percentage body fat is smaller than female. Not just different, but smaller. So here we have our n, our x bar of body fat, which was the observed in the sample, which is 23. That's the, the expected mean under the null hypothesis. That's the standard error, which is the standard deviation divided by square root of n. And that's the z statistic that I compute by subtracting the x bar from the mean, mean mu and dividing by the standard error because then I have how many standard deviations above the mean is this score and this score is 96 standard deviations above the mean which means it's very very far from the mean remember that if it's two standard deviations above the mean it's already not very likely because you're going to be hitting those rejection areas after that right the tails the very small tails of the distribution so the p-value is virtually zero because it's ver you know remember the mean plus or minus three standard deviations include virtually 100 percent of the data so 96 standard deviations above the mean there's pretty much zero likelihood of observing that under the null hypothesis not precisely zero but it's 0, 0.000 so many zeros that it's beyond the precision of r to estimate just remember that when you're running the statistic and it's one-sided test you need to decide whether you want the the lower tail probability of the or the upper tail when you're running a directional hypothesis that the observed is less than the null you want the lower tail right so the lower tail input needs to be set to true because that's the one you want if you set lower tail to false which many of you did you will get a probability of one because if the probability of this piece is zero and the full curve will have the probability of one. Um, the probability of the upper tail is always the probability one minus the probability of the lower tail. One minus zero is one. So if you set the parameter wrong, then you're gonna get the wrong probability, okay? Just make sure when you're doing a one tail test that you set, you ask for the right tail, okay? Um, what goes with uh, the one tail test for you to get consistent results is you want the 90% confidence interval because the 90% confidence interval will put 5% rejection on one side and 5% rejection area on the other side because you have 90 in the middle and you're gonna have 5% on each side, which is what you want. If you're running a one-sided test, you're basically ignoring the, po the possibility that things could go this way. You're pretty certain that things will not go this way. So we basically do not put, we, not, we, not, we don't distribute our 5% re 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 rejection area in both sides, right? We put 5% all on one side. And that will leave 90 in the middle because things are symmetric. So here we're seeing that 20, 35 is not within the confidence interval. So we can reject the null hypothesis through confidence interval estimation as well. 
when we get back, we'll continue on with this example and others.